Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Rudy El Khoury, Dean of the School of Architecture. I'd like to welcome you to our lecture tonight. And as always, I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsor, Technograss, whose generosity actually allows us to sustain the great ambitions we have for our lecture se series, such as with the possibility of tonight's event. Tonight, our speaker, uh, Guy Nordensen, will present Climate Adaptation and Coastal Resilience, a title that would be, would be fitting for our entire lecture series this year, and a topic that is of critical importance for Miami, given that our city is widely considered ground zero for sea level rise vulnerability. Guy Nordensen is a structural engineer and professor at University, uh, Princeton University. He launched his independent practice in 1997 after establishing and leading the New York office of uh, Arab. Uh, Nordensen was the structural engineer for the 2004 MoMA expansion in New York the Jubilee Church in Rome, the Nelson Atkins Museum in, of Arts in Kansas City, to name just a few of the remarkable buildings that benefited from his expertise. Recent projects include the expansion of the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., and the Menil Drawing Institute in Houston, Texas. Nordenson was the first practicing structural engineer to be elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was commissioner and secretary of the New York City Public Design Commission from 2006 to 2015, and is a member of the New York City Panel on Climate Change. In 2013, he re his research team at Princeton was awarded a major grant for the Rockefeller, from the Rockefeller Foundation to develop structures of coastal resilience in collaboration with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. In 2016, he published Reading Structures, 39 projects and built works with Lars Muller Publishers, a companion to his 2010 collections of essays, Patterns and Structure. Now please join me in welcoming Guy Nordensen. Thank you. This is a, quite a formidable room to speak in. As I was telling um, Rodolfo, I feel like I should have a table here with a cadaver <laughs> and, and give my lecture over the cadaver. Um, but it's going to be more optimistic than that. So I want to go through a number of projects with you that go back about 10 years. Uh, which also chart my involvement in this area. As Rodolfo mentioned, most of my practice is involved with building um, structures, um, doing the structural engineering for ver various buildings. But I got involved in this field um, together with my wife, Catherine Sievet, who is a, a landscape architect 10 years ago, starting with the project that we did um, uh, which I'll show you, uh, supported by the American Institute of Architects. I'll briefly talk about that project, which we call Palisade Bay, and then go through briefly also an exhibition that came out of that, and then sp spend most of my time talking about the, the Structures of Coastal Resilience project that Rodolfo mentioned. We applied actually at the uh, instigation of my dean at the time at Princeton, Stan Allen, for a grant uh, from the AIA, which is called the Latrobe Prize. And at that point, I had been working for a number of years after 9-11 down at Ground Zero and had been involved in a couple of projects thinking about not just the redevelopment of Ground Zero after 9-11, but also the 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 larger region and some of the issues related to the p placement of some of the facilities, for example, the television tower 
um, that was on top of the World Trade Center towers in other locations around, around the region. And that got us thinking in general about the New York Harbor and the Bay. And so when uh, Stan Allen suggested that we get involved and apply for this grant, it occurred to me that there was an opportunity to think about the, um, the New York City Harbor, particularly the upper harbor between the Verrazano Bridge and Lower Manhattan, as an opportunity to consider ways to adapt to sea level rise and other effects of climate change, but also to use that as an occasion to rethink this as a kind of public space for the city. So this is an image that we produced for this research in the book that we published that I just showed you on the water, which looked at ways in which the transformation of the coastline and the harbor could become an opportunity to create a number of advantages to the ecology, to the local ecology, but also give this body of water a sense of place um, for the region as a whole. So multiple objectives, multiple agendas in parallel, driven by the necessity to think through what sea level rise and, um, and climate change would do for New York. For example, one of the effects of sea level rise, as you all know, is to uh, make hurricane and other storms uh, impact more severe since you're starting from a higher level. But another effect is to submerge the existing wetlands and other coastal features because of the sea level rise and lose the advantages that they have to offer to the bay. Since most of the edges around a place like New York City are hard after a certain point, once the sea level rises, you don't have the opportunity to migrate those wetlands um, further upland because there are things in the way. And so one approach to dealing with that is to build more um, ecological systems, wetlands, islands, other things in the, um, in the bay itself. This, at the time, went against some of the um, preconceptions about what was environmentally acceptable. There had been in New York for a number of years the sort of residue of resistance to any kind of intervention on the water or in the water that resulted from the battle over the West Side Highway that lasted for a long time in the, in the 80s, mostly. The, the pushback on that um, from the environmental community meant that there was a lot of hesitation on the part of government agencies and others to do anything in the water. So the idea that under the circumstances of sea level rise and climate change, we would start to interfere in the water and add things on the water was at the time something of a taboo, but one that people gradually accepted as perhaps a necessity under those circumstances. So we developed this general approach to look at this um, figure of water, uh, which if you um, grew up as I did in New York, was kind of in the background. It wasn't a place that anyone considered as a possible um, center of focus for the region. So one of the things we were trying to do was identify and make visible this as a possible focus, uh, a kind of public space similar to, to Central Park but then also to intervene in it by proposing islands in the middle of it, in some of the um, shallower areas that you see here, but also all kinds of other features around the edge. Basically addressing this place in a way not dissimilar to when Olmsted um, came up with his proposal for Central Park, he also addressed an empty place that at that point in time didn't have an identity or didn't have a design, didn't have um, a presence in the city. So this is part of our agenda was to give this place that same kind of role. Another part of the agenda was to look at ways in which design and this approach to the um, definition of this as a public space would also marry to uh, scientific 
um, research and investigations into what the actual uh, benefits might be of these interventions and how they might interact with floodwaters. So to start that, we built a digital model that incorporated both the bathymetry, the underwater topography, and the on-land topography in one continuous model. This too was a bit radical at the time, the idea that, that, that there was no distinct edge, the idea that if you cut, uh, cut a section through the body of water, you had a continuity from the, the highland down into the underwater landscape. That notion of what has since been um, called the topobathy was also a way of reorienting our thinking to perceiving the, the, the continuity of that, of that landscape. We then took those digital models and started doing some very preliminary studies looking at ways in which the inflow of water in a storm might be affected by these islands that we were then putting into, um, into the bay. How would they reduce the accumulation of waves? How would they otherwise mitigate some of the impact of, of the coastal storms, as well as providing all the other advantages that we argued for? We were working together with Adam Urinsky and Steve Cassell at Architecture Research Office, and their team also spent quite a bit of time investigating on this water table that we borrowed from the University of Michigan, ways in which the, the fluid dynamics uh, around certain types of forms could instigate ways of thinking about the shaping of islands, how we might generate both from the grid of the city but also from the fluid interaction of land and water, these patterns which were then deployed as part of the design proposal for what could be done in, in lower Manhattan. This was the first of a series of projects um, that we developed in this um, research effort 10 years ago, which has led since to many other um, strategies and proposals for what to do in lower Manhattan all of which take on this notion that you build in the water, you soften the edge, and you provide some amount of protection, but you do all these things together. So having finished that research and the book, I then spent some time um, talking it through with, um, with Barry Bergdahl, who was the curator, uh, chief curator at MoMA at the time, I had done some exhibitions together with um, Terry Riley before, and I'd been the engineer for the museum as well. So I had a relationship with MoMA and tried to um, sell them on the idea that we could take this topic and use it as a basis for a, um, an exhibition. The actual way in which it got organized ultimately in this project, Rising Currents, was um, the creation of Barry Bergdahl, who came up with the idea that we would invite a series of New York-based architects to look at the research that we had com concluded and take on projects around the Upper Harbor, developing further and in more detail the ideas that we had advanced, and do that in a workshop at the museum. The interesting and, and, and rather original idea in this was that the museum had committed to exhibiting, exhibiting works that they weren't sure, which they didn't know what, um, what they would be. So the workshop itself was, was set up to produce the work that later went into the exhibition. What was nice about the workshop, um, where the five teams worked on these five areas that we had identified, was that through that process, they were bouncing ideas back and forth amongst themselves. There was an element of competition, of course. But we were also able to bring a lot of agencies from around the New York and city and New York um, state region to talk about this subject. And at the time, this was novel. And for them, the notion that there could be potential corollary benefits to climate adaptation was something um, fresh and also the importance and, and imperative of trying to address this problem um, was not yet quite on their agenda. So the workshop, the museum exhibition was a tool as well to promulgate these ideas and get a discussion going between the various agencies um, in the city and, and the state. 
this is the exhibition itself, which included a whole series of models and drawings um, and is, is contained in a catalog that was published um, uh, shortly after the exhibition, which is still available, called Rising Currents. After that, uh, the, 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 the sort of thinking behind both the research and the exhibition was incorporated in a plan produced by uh, Amanda Burden and the Department of City Planning in New York. And already, as you can see from the cover of the plan, they had appropriated this notion of continuity between land and water. Broken, breaking away from the, the, until that point, conceptual categorization that it existed, that there was this waterfront, that, that the land stopped and something else started along this hard line, rather thinking that perhaps it was time to consider the dynamic character of that line, both with tidal changes, with ecological changes, and of course, with the effect of sea level rise. So, as Amanda Burden said at the time, we had, we had changed the DNA of the city and invented what she called the sixth borough of the city, which was um, the water. A little bit later, we had the hurricane in 2012 Sandy, which of course um, was quite devastating for the area and demonstrated to a lot of people the possible um, future consequences as well of, of sea level rise and storms. And so uh, Governor Cuomo put together a commission to think about the future of New York State and how it would adapt to, um, to climate change and incorporated again many of the ideas that had been um, advanced through the research and through the MoMA exhibition. So in effect, the research and especially um, the dissemination through the MoMA show was an important way of getting the word out and getting, um, getting these ideas about soft infrastructure, about the role of design, about many other um, features and ideas into the bloodstream of at least um, New York State. It's important also, I think, to, to um, identify as well this structure that Barry Bergdahl had um, created that we worked on with rising currents of the competitive process of design and of the leadership that designers could have in uh, advancing these novel strategies. And this is a methodology that has been since adopted through many other um, uh, initiatives like Rebuild by Design or Changing Courses. Um, which I think you've heard of from, from Hank Olvink and, and, um, and David Wagner. So finding a role for designers, giving them uh, an opportunity to think how these changes could contribute positively to both the urban um, environment and the ecological environment was a big, I think, um, contribution of that, um, of that effort. Another thing that happened after um, Sandy was we were asked to put together a project um, by the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, Rockefeller had actually been the lead in organizing this commission. And so many of the people that were involved in producing this commission report, which by the way is, is quite good and is available online if you just Google NYS 2100 commission. Um, and then, by the way, I didn't mention this, also after Sandy, Mayor Bloomberg organized a huge task force that produced this document, which is unmatched in its complexity and, and detail, which proposed 256 measures for the New York area that would um, improve its resilience and, um, and resistance to future storms. It's a major effort, a major planning document and it too incorporated many of the ideas that had been advanced um, uh, before. So now with this project, we had an opportunity here to deepen what we had been doing um, on the earlier projects, bringing together design teams, in this case led by landscape architects. So we worked with um, four different universities, um, Paul Lewis, my colleague at at Princeton led one team. My wife, Catherine Sievet, led a landscape architecture team at City College. 
And um, there were two other teams at Penn State and, and the GSD, uh, the GSD one led by, um, by um, uh, Michael Van Valkenburg. All four were given sites along the North Atlantic coast and were asked to work together with a scientific group that we set up to develop strategies for those four sites with the intent that those strategies would be influential on the Army Corps, who had been tasked by Congress at the time to come up with a comprehensive plan for the North Atlantic region. Now, I don't know how much you know about the Army Corps of Engineers, but it's a very interesting organization historically. And if, you're, um, um, if you have any interest, there's a very good book called Structures in the Stream which tells the story of, of the Army Corps. It was founded early on in the, in the Republic um, in conjunction really with the founding of West Point. And both were modeled after a French um, example, particularly the um, Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, which combined science, technology, and military and was um, intended to build a cadre, to educate a cadre of engineers who would be able to oversee the regional planning of the country. So the planning of infrastructure, of waterways, and other um, uh, aspects of commerce around the country that was organized not by a state to state jurisdiction or city jurisdictions but jurisdictions that were really tied to natural features, watersheds, the Mississippi watershed, for example, um, the North Atlantic region in this case. And so they're one of the few groups in government who have the responsibility to think strategically about large regional um, uh, districts, and in particular, think about them in terms that marry to the ecological conditions, to the to the, um, the watersheds, et cetera. So they're, they're a great partner to work with from that perspective, even if, of course, there are a lot of um, constraints and limitations. So we were, we were pretty excited by that, 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 that prospect. We created a, a, a framework for this research which um, had the ambition of marrying the advanced science in both climate and storm modeling together with the, the design teams. And the importance here is that I found um, that much of the literature and much of the experience um, in the area of flood um, protection and flood um, studies has recognized the difficulties in using the existing flood maps that are produced. There are many studies that have been um, published by the National Academy of Science and others that shows the many inconsistencies that exist in the flood maps that are produced around the country for both um, river flooding and coastal flooding. There's a long story um, behind this, but part of it is the slow process of updating. Part of it is the balkanization of the way in which the maps are produced, the differing quality of data for topography and other information that goes into the maps and the different ways in which the flooding is calculated. And for that matter, the fact that the, the maps don't take into account for many political reasons, the effects of sea level rise and climate change. So we're in a situation in trying to deal with this problem, particularly in the context of sea level rise, where the data and scientific information that we have is not particularly reliable. So one of the things that we wanted to do was bring the best that we could get our hands on to bear on the problem so that we would both gain the insight and understanding that would give us, but also use the quality of the science and, and, um, and mapping as a, as a tool to convince others that in fact our approach and our strategy was better um, than, than other alternatives. So to do that, first we set up a general, very simple framework that would organize our approach. And that was to say, in all cases, 
we felt that it was important that there always be at least three features to any design for coastal protection. One was that there should be some offshore um, uh, ecological, breakwater, any kind of oyster bed, some island, some kind of interventions out in the water offshore that would help to mitigate the wave um, energy before it reached the shore. That there would inevitably have to be some amount of shore protection levees or otherwise. Hopefully those would be built into the landscape. And that finally, you had to anticipate and plan for the likelihood that in some cases the water would overtop that protection and would get in. And so the communities had to plan for a certain amount of flooding regardless of what the protection um, uh, was that existed on the coastline. And I, I think that's an important consideration. If you look at what happened in New Orleans, there was the belief that once the protection was built, you basically could ignore the risk. But clearly, sometimes the protection fails or sometimes the water goes over the top. And so you've got to take that into account and plan um, accordingly. So this idea of layered approach and also layered thinking about the different scenarios that one has to consider. We then um, brought together a series of analyses that one of my colleagues, Michael Oppenheimer, had done in a project that was um, initiated by Michael Bloomberg called Risky Business, where he has gone around and determined the um, sea level rise at a local level. If you go around the coastline, say, of the United States, there are many different situations that, um, that factor into the calculation of the sea level rise in those locations. Um, one is the proximity to, to the northern um, Greenland ice cap, which tends to create a bulge in the water in addition to the sea level rise. Another is land subsidence, as in New Orleans or Norfolk and other places. So you've got to take into account the local circumstances in evaluating what the sea level rise is going to be. And we had that information and the probability distribution associated with that information for the four locations that we were studying. The next thing we did, which is in some ways the most significant, was to turn to the global circulation models that are used by the International Panel on Climate Change to simulate future and present hurricanes. Now, um, all of the predictions that are made about what the consequences of carbon emissions are, are made based on complex models of the planet together with the oceans and atmosphere, which predict what will happen to the distribution of temperature rise across the planet as a result of certain scenarios associated with certain levels of, of carbon emission. There are about 30 of those models worldwide. And what IPCC does every um, time it comes, goes through a cycle is look at the results of all those models, bring together all the researchers associated with those models, and reach a consensus about what the different models have to say and how to weigh their results together to reach a consensus prediction. So those models are very carefully calibrated, constantly updated, constantly benchmarked against the data that we get from actual weather systems. And they, serve, they can serve as a tool to create simulated hurricanes both in the current climate conditions and in future climate conditions. And from that, you can get a very wide um, set of these um, hurricane tracks, some of which go near your site and then develop a probability distribution that tells you what kinds of hurricanes of what severity are likely to occur in your um, region, and then look into the future as well and make similar predictions for the future. So you take different models. These are, the, these are four different models of the 30 that are available that we picked, and you get an average of the results from those models looking into the future. You then take the models that are generated at the, uh, by, by um, National Oceanographic Atmospheric uh, Research Agency in, um, uh, of the federal government and use those then, which are 
digital uh, models of the coastline to calculate for the set of hurricanes that you've collected what the storm surges are likely to be in your region. Go to the topobathies that you've created for each location, similar to the one that I show you for the New York Harbor, and then develop inundation maps for the four different locations based on that calculation. So, so basically, we start fresh, and we use uh, an approach that allows us to look both at present and future conditions and take into account the changes in the atmosphere, the changes in circulation that will result from um, the increased temperature um, associated with certain emission um, scenarios. So it's not the last word. It's not um, the only answer, but it is a strategy that we're trying to develop and put out there as an alternative model to generating estimates of future um, flooding. So what do we get out of that? We get these matrices, which I'll show you in a little bit more detail, one for each site, which look at a slice across different probabilities in the vertical direction, floods that occur on a regular basis, all the way down to, at the bottom of the table, floods that are extremely rare and then how that will change over time advancing into the future and picture in that way the general um, situation really that any kind of flood protection design has to, has to deal with. So let me show you two examples um, in conclusion. One is for Jamaica Bay. Well, Jamaica Bay is an interesting um, situation is huge. It's, uh, you know, the Rockaways are about the same length as Manhattan. So it's a very large um, part of the New York area. And it's a barrier island and a back bay region, um, which all of which is uh, fairly densely populated. There is a series of communities along the Rockaways, many different um, kinds along there from um, well-to-do to, to, to poor. And then there is a lot of communities in the back bay around the coastline, also um, many, different, um, many different income um, brackets and many different political persuasions for that matter. So it's a complex environment with lots of different types of people living in it, and it's extremely vulnerable to flooding as we saw um, in Hurricane Sandy. Now in the bay itself, there are a lot of islands which are protected. Um, there's a lot of parkland there as well, some of the green spaces that you see here in this picture. And those islands and wetlands have a role, not just in the ecology, but also in their capacity to dissipate wave energy that comes in with, with storms. So it's a system with all these things in play. So we started out um, working uh, in model form, both physical and, and digital, and developing a strategy that had three basic um, categories shown here in blue, green, and, and red. The first um, strategy was to create a series of overwash um, channels, if you will, some all the way over there on, the, on your right would be actually pipes going under the, under the barrier islands. Others would be overland. And the intention here was to create more circulation between the water coming in from the outside and inside on a regular basis. The, there's a lot of stagnant water and some pollution in there. And so one of the things that we wanted to try to do as part of this project was to improve the water quality by flushing some of that water in and out with the tides. The other advantage in some cases would be in some floods that this would also be a way to bring sediment into the back um, bay region. There's a problem of getting enough uh, dirt really into that um, back bay because everything has been paved all around. It's, you know, going back in history, there always used to be runoff coming into the bay and so it was being fed on a regular basis by that soil that doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's no longer a watershed, it's really more of a sewage shed. So how to get more land, how to get better quality water in and out was, was part of this strategy. And so that would mean some interventions 
along here in this um, Fort Tilden Park area, for example, that would allow for that um, to come um, in and out. The next step was to find a way to allow the islands to keep up with sea level rise in a more natural fashion. And, and Catherine Sivadu came up with this project, um, uh, invented the notion of using a system of atolls inspired by the atolls in the Pacific. You would build a ridge around the islands and then bring sediment in either artificially uh, bringing in sand or through these overwash um, channels to get that sediment circulating and then captured within these atolls to build up um, to build up the islands and allow them to keep up with sea level rise rather than coming in and rebuilding and rebuilding the islands as the army corps normally does this would hopefully be a more natural and steady and continuous way of maintaining those, um, those islands. This is the one project actually of our entire research effort that the Army Corps has adopted and now incorporated into their Jamaica Bay, Bay plan. So there will someday be atolls with my wife's name on them. The third um, aspect of this project is the coastal protection. So one is improving the ecology, finding ways to maintain and sustain the health of these islands. Use those islands as a way of mitigating the um, impact of the storms, but still one has to provide protection for each of the communities. Now here we made a strategic choice that rather than build one big barrier across the mouth of the bay, it would be better to build a series of local um, protective uh, measures. This is an interesting and important aspect of this. If you invest in one thing, and that one thing determines the safety of a large area like this, you then depend on a centralized organization like the Army Corps or the federal government to maintain that thing. And we found in New Orleans that that's not always reliable and that they don't always take good care of it. And so while you're assuming that you're well protected, in fact, you are not as you discover in the next storm. It also takes a long time to build these large structures. The Thames barrier that protects London took 35 years to build. The, the system that protects the Netherlands has taken many decades to get built up. If, on the other hand, you go to a more localized protection, you're, you're, you're going with a tradition that goes all the way back to the polder systems or the levee boards in the United States, the polder systems in Holland, where there is potentially a much more localized system of, of maintenance and, and, um, and monitoring. So if you could marry local protection with improved ecological circumstances and, and, and wetlands and so on, potentially you can also build the political structures that go with that where some of these communities, like for example, Howard Beach, would get this protection but also be in a position to keep track of whether it's well kept, maintained, and is actually going to protect the community in a future storm. So, we opted for this approach and developed these um, sketch uh, versions of how that, uh, that might look. And we, we now have a project that we are just starting on funded by the National Science Foundation where we're looking more specifically and in more detail at these, at these communities. This happens to be a community that voted enthusiastically for Donald Trump. Um, so it's going to be a lot of fun to go in there and see what they th have to say about sea level rise. That's um, what it looks like. Actually, another aspect of this that, that is part of the project here is the repurposing of the highway. So here where, where you see up there the Belt Parkway. The Belt Parkway is a band that goes all along the back of this um, region. And it would be quite sensible to work with the transportation um, uh, system there and use that as the line of a potential levy to protect the areas behind it. So lots of ways in which one can find opportunities to multi-purpose 
um, different aspects of, of the infrastructure. So with these ideas, um, you can then plot what might be the, the consequences of introducing them. And so the framework that we proposed here, this matrix, what we call dynamic performance-based design, is a way to look not just in current circumstances at what flooding might be associated with different levels of probability. So the 100-year storm, the 500-year storm, even the most extreme event that you can think of what could all be visualized alongside each other. And if you have this kind of layer of protection, you can see that maybe your protection will take you all the way to the 100 or the 500 year storm, but then there might be another more extreme storm that might come along, which is credible, which, which has a, a, a small but, but, but real probability of occurrence for which you then also plan by elevating utilities and doing other measures to prevent a, a catastrophe. You can then also look in future time windows using these global circulation model um, tools at how these hazards are going to change over time. So the 100-year um, flood today is the 30-year or 20-year flood in the future. And so you can start to see the changes in those um, hazards over time. So here again, looking at the Howard Beach area, you can toggle back and forth between these um, scenarios and maybe even chart the slow implementation of a project because nothing gets done all at once. So you've got to have a way of framing the evolution of your project against the evolution of the, of the hazard. So, um, oh, and the last thing we've been doing is pointing out the fact that different ways of approaching the storm calculations give you different results. And this seems fairly obvious, but if you go to the standard um, FEMA maps for flood insurance, they draw a line and say that if you're on this side of the line, you have to buy insurance, and if you're on that side of the line, you don't. The implication is if you're on this side of the line, you'll get wet, and on that side of the line, you won't which of course is ridiculous. So we have to find a way also to blur that edge and understand what degrees of hazard and risk are associated with these um, coastal regions. And so as, as a first step, we're showing that with this other approach to the analysis, we get similar but still distinctly different results. And so we really have to open up this question and think it through more, more rigorously. So a lot of this information is on the, on the website that we created for this um, project. Now I'll show you finally one um, last project which Paul Lewis did for um, the uh, community behind Atlantic City. This is the barrier island where Atlantic City is up there on the upper right. And if you follow through what happens with increasing um, sea level rise, I'll go through that again, or flooding. One of the interesting things that you notice is that the water always comes in from the backside. And this would seem fairly obvious when you consider the topography of most barrier islands, but it came as a surprise to the Army Corps in Hurricane Sandy that it wasn't enough to just protect um, on the front line that you actually had to worry about the water sneaking up your backside and that um, really changes the nature of the, of the hazard in some ways. So what Paul Lewis has come up with was a proposal for what he calls an amphibious suburb, something between retreat saying, look, this was once a wetland, it should be a wetland, everybody should leave, or fortification, which is let's build a big wall like we have in New Orleans and cry as best we can to keep the water out. What instead he's proposing is a variety of measures that together make this community more resilient or more amphibious. First is to elevate the houses. Second is to actually bring back the wetland to some extent. So recapture some of that land 
letting water come in, take the back alley and turn it into a canal so you can actually irrigate um, to some extent, lift the roadways and put the utilities under the roadways and also make it easier to get from the elevated roads to the elevated houses, and take a community that has a combination of abandoned lots, abandoned houses, houses that are vulnerable, and gradually shift it to a situation where the lots have been um, brought back to nature, canals have been introduced, the roads have been lifted, the houses have been lifted, and on the whole, the community is much more resilient. If you look at it um, community large, wide, under current situation, you know, the water gets in, everybody's flooded. I mean, this town is very low lying. But if you introduce this layered protection, if you have, say, the roadway on the edge is elevated, you have um, some green uh, land, wetland on the outboard side, but you also bring some on the inside. You have gates that allow the water to come into the canals. You elevated the roads, you elevated the houses, and so on. Then eventually you have this different kind of place where if flooding does overtop that edge protection, it might come in, but it might not come in all the way. It might be stopped by the elevated road. It might be contained within these kind of mini polders that you've now created. And then the canals will also allow it to drain out, which is something that is often forgotten in a flood. You know, once you've gotten all the water in, you've got to get rid of it, and you've got to have some kind of system to drain it out. So what's clever about Paul's strategy is having all of these systems overlaid and um, working together to create this um, different kind of, of community. So there's a lot of different places up and down the, the New Jersey coast that can be adapted according to the strategy. What's compelling, I think, in this example is that if you go back and visualize that matrix that starts to tell you what flooding circumstances are you envisioning into the future with different levels of probability, you can associate with that the gradual evolution and transformation of this community over a period of decades and how that matches to the changing nature of the hazard. So I think that's, that's really where, um, and here's some examples of what's already happening, but on a piecemeal basis, what we need is a more coordinated um, strategy. So what we're trying to lay out is a way to bring the science together with design, a way for design to think in, in, in staged, dynamic um, steps into the future, visualizing maybe what the long-term future might look like, but also visualizing the steps along the way, and marrying those to solidly founded, good scientific, Anticipate, anticipatory predictions of what, um, what climate change is going to do. And I think with all of that, we could potentially um, address many of the difficult problems that we face. Thank you. Of course. Yes, ma'am. It's a great project and a great idea. The only thing I was thinking is uh, how long it will take to do all these changes and how much it's going to cost. Hmm. Um, well, those are related, right? I'm sorry? Those are related. If we had yes. enough money, it would go faster. <laughs> the thing is to go faster than the water coming in. Um, you know, the, the town of Galveston in Texas was obliterated by a hurricane in the early part of the 20th century. And what they did was um, build a big seawall, 20-foot seawall, and elevate the town about 15 feet, the entire town. Um, you know, I think we are, we're kind of, um, we're paralyzed by a number of different completely unnecessary obstacles. One is our hesitation to 
raise the taxes that are necessary to do what we need to do. If we don't, for example, I mean, take, take Miami, right? There's a tremendous amount of wealth built into all the real estate that you see going up, all of which will be in deep doo-doo in 20 years. So do you want to see that wealth go up in smoke? Or do you want to institute some tax system that will pay for the kind of protection that will protect that? And maybe people care about that, or maybe they don't. But if they do, the wealth is there. It's just there are all these ideological obstacles that get in the way. You know, that climate change is not real, that taxing is evil, that all these other things, which is a strange mindset. It's like if you have cancer and you keep smoking. It, it doesn't make that much sense. Now, maybe you decide you're going to die and you enjoy cigarettes, and so you'll keep smoking and then you'll die. Or maybe you decide that you want to have a different kind of future. I think you, know, you could get really pessimistic considering what's going on in Washington and what's going on in many states in the country. And even, you know, even in my state, in New York, I get frustrated, even though we have a progressive mayor and a progressive governor, they don't quite yet know how to get it together. And it's going to take a revolution. People are going to have to start to think that it takes some investment to do what's necessary. How much money do we spend in the military? You know, how much money do we spend in Iraq? Spend about a trillion dollars in Iraq. You know, we could have a high-speed rail system in this country for that money. So we make decisions and we bear the consequences, but that doesn't mean we have to keep being forever stupid, you know? The money's there. There's no question about it. Thank you, I'm slightly deaf. Hi, is this better? Okay, I have two questions. I'm actually doing um, research very similar to what you are talking about, and thank you so much for sharing this presentation. Um, my two questions are for New York, per se. Um, did you sorry, also consider the snow versus no snow scenario? Like, does that add to your problem of water management uh, for the city? And the second question is, um, has there been any sort of research on using productivity of wetlands to support the community as a, like, a future. I can't hear you that well. So the first question was about snow? Yeah, the first question is about snow management, I think. And the second is if you've uh, looked at productive wetlands, like um, making use of the wetlands just not for the uh, hydrological part, but also for like agricultural as well. Productive? Wetlands. Like, you can actually grow stuff to, like, have food security or locally produce food in the wetlands. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the, so I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on either of those questions. Um, in terms of snow, you know, part of the problem with climate change is the increased um, moisture in the atmosphere. And so we end up with very severe rainstorms and snowstorms. So we have a lot more stuff to deal with. I think the city has been doing a pretty good job of preparing itself for when it comes and anticipating that there might be more than they think. We had a few bad um, cases a number of years ago, but now so far they've done a good job with, um, I mean, I know in Boston a couple of years ago they had a really bad snowstorm and they had a lot of trouble getting the snow out. Productive wetlands is a great question. Um, I mean, one of the metaphors that has been driving a lot of these ideas is the, the, the oyster, you know, as a kind of filtration, um, ecological filtration device. And so there's a lot, of, um, a lot of interest and a lot of groups that are mobilized to bring oysters back into New York Harbor, not so much for eating, but as a way to help the health of the ecology. There's a fair amount of work in trying to um, build um, nurseries for seagrass, to replant seagrass. So it, it's more in terms of improving the, the ecological benefits. 
rather than food. But I, I, you know, it probably leads in that direction. Yes, sir. I, uh, thank you for a great presentation, which I'm sure is inspiring a lot of our students. I'm just wondering if you have looked at uh, Miami or South Florida, or uh, have the intention of looking at it as a case study also for your group, given it's uh, the unique uh, geology and hydrology that offers more challenges also. I have a student working right now on, on South Beach. Um, I think I'm just learning at this point. You know, the, the unique circumstance of the porous stone makes the Florida situation very, very different. Uh, you can't keep the water out in the normal ways. You know, I, I, I haven't come up with anything better than elevating, you know, and um, I, don't, I don't quite know how else but then there's all kinds of other complex issues with the aquifer and other, which you all know more about than I do. I would, I mean, if, if I, one of the ways that I would try to approach this is to start by making sure that there is a good foundation in understanding what we're dealing with. You know, what, what really are the best um, estimates of what sea level rise is going to look like here, what's going to happen to the hurricanes, what kind of um, inundation to expect from the hurricanes, and just sort of face up to the, the hazard. Is it five meters? Is it 10 meters? You know, what, what are we dealing with? And then I think we were talking on the way here about the um, importance of certain neighborhoods for their cultural heritage quality. Um, I, I, my student who's working on, on Miami Beach you know, pointed out that there are certain parts of Miami Beach, the, the, the Art Deco re areas, other, um, there's a, I think a three block area that has a lot of older buildings in it. You know, starting to think about the conservation, preservation, and protection of those places. You know, maybe there are certain places that need to be elevated to protect cultural heritage. I, you know, there's all kinds of piece by piece steps that could be um, initiated. I, I don't think there's a single solution. You know, there has to be um, a mosaic of, of strategies. Um, more canals, more, more ways for the water to get in and out. Um, it's a huge problem. So could we ask you to blue sky a little bit and zoom out? Um, and away from, let's say, the East Coast and think more about the whole country. Um, I was struck by the voting patterns that seem to coincide with um, coastal vulnerability, among other things. And so that raises a question about all of the other climate change impacts which might be occurring in other parts of the country that will be competing in the long run for resources. So I was quite taken by your um, reference to the history of levee boards, that there's, um, that there's more, there may be more of a local approach, which we know is needed because adaptation is always regional or local. Um, but in terms of resources and maybe overall politics, you've been involved with um, national funding sources. Do you have any, um, imagination about how that might play out over time and if it does if Jamaica Bay isn't getting in the future national funding to do some of those improvements
improvements, do they start making the tough decisions themselves about what to pay for and not pay for? What are your thoughts about that, that kind of larger picture of the whole country dealing with this in many local pieces? Uh, so, <clears throat> I would say that the major inspiration um, for all of this would be to go back and look at the different programs that Roosevelt instituted during the New Deal. And, and there are a lot of, um, you know, for example, farm bureaus that were set up to provide farmers with information about new techniques and new approaches to um, controlling erosion or or changing their crops and other things. And the strategy that, that was established was to get the information that good, solid, scientifically um, rigorous information out to people through the various um, agricultural department programs that were set up. You know, NOAA does a lot. There are a lot of agencies in the federal government that are people by very dedicated public servants and scientists, U.S. Geological Survey, for example, who can be mobilized to provide um, organized information for people to start to do things themselves. I was heavily involved for many years in the earthquake engineering field, and we've had tremendous success in the U.S. in improving the protection of facilities, buildings, otherwise, in, to earthquakes. <clears throat> and, you know, short, short version of that history, it started out with a bunch of, of private citizens, academics, and engineers, and others in California who decided in the 1930s that they needed to understand this problem better. <clears throat> and they formed an NGO, and they started to develop their understandings and work collectively, and eventually, um, were able to institute certain regulations in the state of California, which slowly um, disseminated into the rest of the country. Nixon, of all people, passed a, um, a put a bill through Congress called the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program in the 1970s, which created a framework that said, you know, here's $250 million a year. Some of this goes to the U.S. Geological Survey. Some of it goes to NSF and so on. Some of it goes to FEMA. And this is what you're going to do with it. And for 40 years, they worked on this. And every so often, an earthquake would happen, and there'd be a push. And eventually, we arrived at a strategy that is nationally applicable and adopted with many publications by FEMA and others that are available to homeowners to understand what they can do to make their house more um, resilient in the event of an earthquake. And we have fewer and fewer and fewer um, fatalities due to the earthquakes. Now, one of the features of this program is that the map, similar to the maps that I'm talking about, for earthquake hazards is produced by the US Geological Survey at a budget of approximately $2 million a year. The maps that we get for flood are produced by private companies that were um, in a framework that was set up under the Reagan administration of privatizing the process, where FEMA gives the money to private companies who produce the maps. Depending on which company does it, they're not the same. They don't line up, and they're generally they're okay, but you know they don't take climate change into account and so on, and they cost billions of dollars to produce. So going back to your question, there's a tremendous corruption in, in the system where we get mediocre quality product that would be better if it was produced through government agencies by people who actually care about their public duty and not their pocket. And would then have this information available, you know. So I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the New Deal. A lot of the kind of, you know, thousands of experiments that Roosevelt was, was famous for, which is how we should try to go after this, um, based on good information so that people have available to them the tools, the information, the understanding.
understanding that they need to do, as you say,